Welcome to Legendary Motivation Channel. Join us as we listen to some of Neville Goddard's greatest lectures, books, and radio talks, which might have never been recorded or released on the internet before until now. Sit back and enjoy the masterpiece work of one of America's greatest mystics, Neville Goddard. Tonight's subject is, have you found him? If you're asked that question, you might ask, well, who am I supposed to find? Well, in this, I am saying every man in this world, by man I mean generic man, male, female. Everyone is looking for the source or the cause of the phenomena of life. We speak of this as the father, and I tell you from experience, it's a person, a person as I am, as you are. Everyone is looking for this person who is called the father, the one of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. This is the one of whom I speak tonight. I have met the father. The Father embraced me, incorporated me into his body, so I wear not to mortal eye, but to the other eye. I wear that body. It's the human form divine. It's the body of love, infinite love. On this level it seems insane, but I tell you, it is true. Now tonight we'll try to show you what this Father, when you meet him, how he will appear. We are told in this wonderful poem a friend of mine wrote me, concerning the character called Saul. She is here tonight, I see her. She's a member of a Browning Society, Robert Browning. And in this poem called Saul, based upon the first book of Samuel, the 16th chapter, it is supposed to be based only upon the 14th through the 23rd verses, but may I tell you it's the entire chapter. Saul is demented because of an evil spirit that was sent to him from the Lord. Then David, who was just anointed and made the chosen one of the Lord, plays for him and sings for him and restores him to a perfect state of health. This is the story. Well, in this... David becomes a prophet, a prophet prophesying the coming of the Messiah. David says to Saul, O Saul, it shall be a face like my face that receives thee, a man like unto me thou shalt love and be loved by forever. A hand like this hand shall throw open the gates of new life to thee. See the Christ stand. Now here, no one but one who had experienced this could have written it, but no one. Fortunately for us, he was raised in the environment where the matching of words to thought was an art that they practiced more than most people in the world. And being a poet, he could tell it in this form. Yes, when you see him, he will be a face just like my face. Now I'll tell you from experience, having stood in the presence of the risen Lord, it is true. When you see David, and you will see David, use your imagination if you have not seen the risen Lord. For only apostles see him, when they see him they are incorporated into his body and sent. But you will find David, and when you find David, use your imagination to simply mature the face. Mature that face, and that face matured is the face of the risen Lord. You will see him, and the risen Lord is reflected in the face of David. He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature. When you look at him, a youth, the eternal youth buried in the mind of man that comes forward, and man sees him, he calls man who sees him father. That child who calls you father reveals to you who you really are. And may I tell you, when you see him, having first seen the risen Lord and been incorporated into his body, you feel as you look at David, you are that risen Lord. You are not the little thing that is here. You are not this at all. So we are told in the 27th Psalm, Thou hast said, Seek ye my face. My heart says to thee, Thy face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not thy face from me, verse 8. Hide it not, I'm supposed to see his face. Well, I'll find him one day, the world will find him, I found him. But may I tell you, I cannot take any credit for it, it was a gift. I cannot honestly, searching my entire soul, find anything that I have ever done worthy of beholding the face of the risen Lord. I was brought in spirit into his presence, and standing in his presence he asked me a question. I answered it, and having answered it, he embraced me and incorporated me into his body. There's only one body, there's only one spirit, only one Lord, only one God and Father of us all. But it comes in a certain way. He had to send me. To send me, he had to first bring me into his presence and allow me to behold his face. For as Paul said in the ninth chapter of Corinthians, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? 1 Corinthians 9, 1. So here I have found him. Found whom? I have found the one of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, John 1.45. The word Jesus is simply the word Jehovah. It means Savior, 
That's all that it means. And there's only one Savior in the world. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And besides me, there is no Savior. Is 43.3.11 Now let me share with you two stories tonight. If you were here back in the spring of the year, you recall an experience of a friend of ours who heard a voice coming from within. This lady is very feminine, very much a lady, very feminine. And she heard the voice coming from within her. This is on the 23rd day of March of this year. And the voice said, You are David, my dear, and I want to love you with all my heart. Here this lady is called David, the name of a male, and the voice is saying, I want to love you with all my heart. Then the voice proclaims, I am God, then goes this far, and I am you. In that wonderful 10th chapter of John, I and the Father are one, verse 30. He declares that you are my son, for in the second psalm we are told, and this is the decree of the Lord, David is speaking. He said unto me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Verse 7. Here now she is called David, and the one who calls her David declares, I am God and I am you. We are one. I and my begotten are one. Now she's had a series since then. I go back now to the 24th day of May, two months later, and this voice has been speaking to her daily from within, for the ears are open now. As we're told in the 40th Psalm, Thou hast bored an ear for me, verse 6, that I may hear that which comes from within. For as Browning said, Truth is within ourselves. It takes no rise from outward things, whatever you may believe. There is an inmost center in us all, where truth abides in fullness. Then he paints this strange, wonderful word picture, how he envelops himself in flesh and causes nothing but error, that as flesh is put upon it, he looks out upon a world and all things are distorted. But then he tells us, and to know rather consists in opening out a way whence the imprisoned splendor may escape than in effecting entry for a light supposed to be without, Paracelsus. So the whole thing is coming from within, but you don't really hear it and understand it until these are bored. So in her case, it is bored. Now this is what she hears on the 24th day of May, the same voice of authority coming from within her. I am God himself. I am he who brings you into this world and takes you out. Now the first statement is repeated, which is most important. I am God himself. When you find a thing repeated in scripture that is the essence of truth, then it makes the statement, I am, I am, I am God forever. I will never leave you. You are me, my son, my son, my son. I am speaking to you from the depths of being. It is only doubts and fears. And now comes this lovely sentence, and I know you, Virginia. I am, I am, I am. Jesus Christ is your world. I say to her and to all of you, this lady tonight, no matter what she has to go through, has been redeemed. The first verse of the 43rd chapter of Isaiah will reveal it. And here is the verse. The Lord is speaking. I have redeemed you, for I have called you by name. You are mine. Verse 1. When the ear, the inner ear, is open to the point where you are called by name, you are redeemed. So no matter what she has to go through in the time to come, she can always lean against this experience of hers and relate it to this parallel verse in Scripture. I have redeemed you. For I have called you by name, you are mine. So here I will say to everyone, have you found him? And if you haven't found him, may I tell you, don't despair. When I found him, it was a gift, really a gift. I don't honestly say I was looking for him, seeking him, it just happens. Well, if it happened to me, it will happen to everyone. But in this heavenly order, there are certain levels as there are in this world. If for the work I have to do, back thirty-odd years ago, if I was called then into his presence, then I could behold his face, and then having seen his face, I become the thing I behold. For that is scripture. I become that which I behold. But I didn't know I would behold him that night. In 1929, when I was taken in spirit into his presence and asked to name the greatest thing in the world, and when I answered in the words of Paul, quoting the three, Faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. 1 Corp. 13.30 At that moment he embraced me and incorporated me into his body. I fused. And from that moment I have felt no divorce from that body. I walk the earth and you see Neville. I don't feel this little garment that I shave in the morning. I go to sleep at night and I put this garment down. I walk the earth in this garment and you know me as this. But I don't feel this. Not as I walk not as I sleep. And yet, I am just as normal as you are. 
I have never felt any estrangement from that body since it was incorporated, that is, this little being of whatever I am was incorporated into it. For we are told, he who is united to the Spirit becomes one with him. He whoever is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. 1 Corp. 617. And from that day back in 1929 to this day, I have felt no estrangement from that spirit. Even though in the interval in this world I have done all the little things that man would do, all the things that you would think, certainly the Lord wouldn't do it. Well, if anything is ever done in this world that the Lord wouldn't do, then the Lord isn't underscore, underscore, underscore. Do you know of one thing that is done that the Lord didn't do? If you know one thing, well then, he is something maybe even greater than the Lord you know. And so, in this wonderful statement of hers, and Jesus Christ is your world, certainly Jesus Christ is her world, as it is your world. Jesus Christ is called in Scripture, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Cor 1 24. By this power all things come into your world, so whatever you have in your world is created by this power. There is nothing but this power, so your world is Jesus Christ, and man will lose his faith in God, whose idea of Christ is smaller than his world. If your concept of Christ is smaller than the universe, you don't know Christ. This whole vast world is created by Christ. So when she is told, and Jesus Christ is your world, the voice in the depth of her own being is proclaiming the most profound truth. It is your world. You brought everything into this world. The other day, I read this little statement of Sir James Jeans, one of the greatest astrophysicists of all the ages, and he said, on this planet, a man cannot raise his hand and not affect the farthest star. It is here that the drama is taking place. You cannot raise an arm. You can't think without affecting the farthest star. That's how great you really are. You know why? Because God became you that you may become God. The scripture teaches this. You're told in the first of John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse one, the word logos, the translated word means the plan, but the plan itself is God. Now in the 14th verse we're told, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father. So here the word God himself became flesh. God gave himself to you that you may become God. That is the mystery of scripture, that God actually became as I am, so that I may be as he is. So here we find this wonderful story in that 14th verse of 1 John, and the word was made flesh, became flesh, and dwelt among us. Now the word among is the preposition, the Greek preposition in, which means within. As we're told in the 1 John also, among you stands one whom you do not know, John 1, 26. Well, you think it means someone around here? No, within you. The word means within. It means a fixed position in space, time, or state. But one of the great definitions given to this preposition, in, is to give self wholly to. Read it in your concordance, James Strong's concordance, giving the original definitions of these words, to give self wholly to. Well, God gave himself wholly to you. He isn't pretending that he's a man. He emptied himself and took upon himself the form of man and became obedient unto death, even death upon this cross of man. 2. 7. This body is the cross on which God is crucified, and now he will actually rise from this cross taking you with him, and then he and you are one. So God actually became man that man may become God. I'm speaking to you from experience, but now, without offense to anyone who may bear the name, may I tell you, when I was sent to tell you this story back in 1929, it was not to protect the faith of Mrs. Murphy. It was to tell you the true story of the mystery of Christ and not to protect and safeguard the faith of someone who has been misled in her belief about what this story is all about. It is all within us. The drama unfolds within us, every one of us. It is not the Father's will that one be lost. Well, nothing but the Father's will will ever be fulfilled. Not my will, but thine be done. Therefore, because it's not the Father's will that one be lost, not one will be lost. But why this interior level of awareness, I do not know. Paul describes it in his letter to the Corinthians, how there are certain, like an army, there are generals, there are colonels, then we have majors, we have all these levels of being. He puts the apostle as the first, and he puts the prophet as the second, and the teacher as the third, and the worker of miracles as the fourth. Now, 
Why he does this, I do not know from experience. I have not experienced that. I can only tell you that I did use his words when I stood in the presence of the risen Christ. So I have to go along with Paul, because it was the word I read in 13th Corinthians that I used when the risen Christ asked me to name the greatest thing in the world. Then when he embraced me and I fused with his body and became one with him, and then was sent into the world with these words ringing in my ears. And the words translated in modern language, the words are misunderstood if I use them, the words were down with the blue bloods. People will think I mean down with that which is the social order. Hasn't a thing to do with that. The blue bloods means church protocol, the traditions of men as against the commands of God. And the whole vast world is full to overflowing with the traditions of men. You shouldn't eat meat on Friday. Now for hundreds of years that remained because they wanted to sell fish. And now they have changed it and now you may eat meat. After all these centuries it's not a sin anymore. Well then the early fathers were all married. The Bible speaks of Peter's wife. It speaks of all these relationships. Then comes maybe a man who was impotent and wanted all in his world to be as impotent as he, and so he made the order. Now they're all agog about it, and they want to change that order. They will, and when they do it, it will only take a few generations for them all to accept it, and then all things will be all right. It'll be nice and acceptable. These are the traditions of men. So when I was sent into the world, the voice rang out, down with the blue bloods, down with church protocol. They know nothing concerning what the true church of the world is. Hasn't a thing to do with anything made with the human hand. The church is underscore, underscore, underscore. The, it is the assembly of the resurrected, and the resurrected are incorporated into the body of the risen Christ. So the body of Christ is the church, but it's a real body, a body as real as you are now. It's one body made up of all the resurrected, and all will be eventually resurrected, and all will be incorporated into the one body, and that body is Jesus Christ, believe it or not. Within that body there are orders as there are within this body. The eyes perform a different function from the ear. It performs a little function from other parts of my body, and all perform their different functions. And so he takes eight, which is the name of Christ or the number of Christ, and gives eight orders within the body of Christ. But what determines this I cannot tell you, I do not know. I only know I have found him. I beheld his face, incorporated myself into it because he embraced me. And when I found David, David was simply a young impression of the ancient of days, that is underscore, underscore, underscore. If I could take my imagination and just put it upon David and see him matured, it would be the being who embraced me. So when Browning in his vision said, O oh Saul, David is speaking, he's prophesying the coming of Messiah. And he said to Saul, O oh Saul, it shall be a face like my face that receives thee. A man like to me thou shalt love and be loved by forever. A hand like this hand shall throw open the gates of new life to thee. See the Christ stand in his poem called Saul. Only one who has had the experience could have done it. Hear that earlier poem Paracelsus, and he wrote it when he was 23. He died 1849. And here, in this short underscore, 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 because he had the vision. And so, when he could say, there is an inmost center in us all where truth abides in fullness, he meant that. And to know, you don't go at it on the outside, rather consists of opening out a way whence the imprisoned splendor may escape than in effecting entry of a light supposed to be without. And the whole vast world is seeking it from without. They go into diets and say, you know I don't eat meat. Well then, I'm more holy than the other one who eats meat. If I don't do this and don't do that and don't do the other, and they go into all these things trying to acquire merit. I go across the country to find those who I thought heard it didn't really hear. One told me in New York City last year she is going to prove to me I'm wrong, and she's going to actually do it by sheer imagination, by proving that she can conjure this. Then she joined some yoga society, and she went off. She has all the money in the world. To indulge herself, she went off to do meditation. This past week I got a very oh sad letter from a close friend of the family's who sees her in her household in this mental state of decline. Her husband doesn't know what has happened to her, her sons are all despairing, and she herself doesn't know. Uh, but she doesn't remember what I told her, you try it and keep on doing it, and you'll only go where all go who think they can earn salvation. It is all grace, 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 and still more grace. You don't earn it. 
live a loving, wonderful life in this world and exercise your imagination lovingly on behalf of everyone in the world. And wait, don't try to force it. You cannot force it. You'll be called in God's own good time. When you are called, you'll be fitted into the body of God and the body is one of love. It doesn't really matter if you play the part of the teacher, the miracle worker, the helper, the administrator, the speaker in tongues. All these are part of the body of God. And if one is playing the part of the apostle, it is God's choice, which was in the beginning. It's not something that he himself earned. He didn't earn it. We are all chosen in the beginning before the whole thing started. It is a play. It's a plan. But she could not believe it, and comes this despairing letter to help in my own way a prayer to bring her out of this state into which she has gone. Because she can buy things, she thinks she can buy this. So she has money, because maybe 18 years ago in the city she heard me speak and she applied it towards wealth and she got it. On a seeming blind date, she met a man of fabulous wealth and married him, bore him two lovely sons. Now she has wealth. Because that happened, now she transcends it all and you forget just how it worked and you're even going to apply it. And there's a difference between the law and the promise. I teach both. I teach everyone to apply law to everything in this world that they want, outside of the promise. The promise is God's promise to man and it's unmerited, unearned. You don't earn it. No one can earn grace. Grace is God's gift of himself to man. So in this, when this friend of ours heard the voice coming from within, I am you. First he calls the son, and then he tells her who he is, and then he tells her that I am you, we are one. We are in what position we fill in the body of God, we are still one. No one is greater than the other, not in the body of God. But here we think we can outsmart the other, and now this, all right, do it if you want to do that. In this world you may have anything you want, you may on this level in the world of Caesar, anything you want. You want to be wealthy, you may have it, you want to be known. You may have it. You want to be anything? You may have it. But when it comes to God's promise, then leave it alone and just wait in hope and hope that it is now. As far as I am concerned, hope that it is now. But don't think that you can make it now. Just hope that it is now. And then go forward in this conviction. So here, I ask, have you found him? You'll find him when you see David. And when you see David, David will call you father. And then you found him. For everyone is searching for the Father. Everyone is searching for the Father. He doesn't know it. There's only one Father, one God, and Father of us all, who is above all, through all, and in all. That's what we're really searching for, but we think we're searching for security. Security only reflects the state of being secure. You want security? All right, assume that you are, and things will happen in your world, and you'll have things. You'll think that is your security. That's not your security. The state in which you fell is your security. They only bear witness. They are the fruit of the tree that you occupy. Get out of that state and the fruit will vanish, and you'll wonder what happened. You will say, well, the market went down, or someone deceived me, or my product is no longer wanted by the world, and therefore I've lost out. It isn't so. It's all within you. You enter a state and the state bears fruit. So the whole vast world only bears witness of the states we are in. So you can enter any state in this world, abide in that state, and it bears fruit. But when it comes to finding him, and I haven't found one person outside of a small little circle like here, and two who have found him. I wouldn't say two one. I do not know the other one yet, haven't found him. I have found him with the birth. I haven't found him with David. But my friend who is here tonight, yes, he's found him. And that one called him as he called me David. And so that same face, there's only one David. So the David of biblical fame is my son. The David of biblical fame is your son, but you don't know it yet because you haven't found him. When you find him, he's going to call you father, and you will know that you are the very being you've been seeking. I'm seeking the cause of the phenomena of life, and one day I find that I am he. I am the cause of the phenomena of my world, but I didn't know it until the son called me father, and there's only one father. He is the one of whom it is said in the second psalm, I will tell of the decree of the Lord, he said unto me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Verse 7. So when he calls me father, then I know whom I have received. Now a lady wrote me a wonderful letter last Monday night, and I must share it with you. It's dated the 11th, so she wrote it undoubtedly from here. It's all in pencil. She said, 
I found myself in a dream, so it would be the night before I found myself in a schoolyard waiting for my husband, Ray. Now all of the fathers had to come via an obstacle course. When the fathers arrived, the children became animated. They had to come via an obstacle course. When the fathers arrived, the children became animated. When Paul is departing from this world, he writes in his letter to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is now laid up for me the crown of righteousness. 2 Tim 4, 7. It is a race, but the race is an obstacle race. It is life. Life is an obstacle race. And the fathers are coming back. We are the fathers. May I tell you, all of us are the fathers. And put us all together. Without one missing, we form the Lord. For the word Elohim is a compound unity. That's what the word means, one made up of others. We are the one who fell and became fragmented and all separated into this fantastic experience. Then all are gathered together one by one to unite into a single man who is God. So the fathers have come back, but as they come, they must come via an obstacle race. And when they come, the children become animated. Isn't that a marvelous experience? So I want to thank her and I want to thank my friend for her wonderful story, the story I told tonight. And before we close, the one I told last Monday night, where this friend's advertising campaign increased within three months the client's net of $75 million. And so I said, in a simple manner, I do not know if he has the same client. So he writes, indeed, we have the same client. Not only do we have the same client, but they are asking us to modify our advertising. Because we are making so much money, we have no place to invest it. And money made without investment is stupid. To put money in a bank and say I have a million dollars in a bank drawing nothing, that's nothing. It could go like the marks of Germany after the First World War. So you had a million dollars in the bank, underscore, underscore, underscore. It isn't. And so, to make fortunes and have nowhere you can put it where it earns money, that's stupid. And so, his client is still his client, but ask the agency that he represents to please modify this ad. Because we're bringing in so much money and making so much money that we have no place to invest it. So he said, we certainly do. And he used the word, indeed we have the same client. So I thank him, and thank you for your letters. Now next Monday night, I have the most wonderful letter to share with you. Benny wrote me a long series that I got today, and I got others today. And from the same one whose story I told last Monday, I got his just about two weeks ago, and that is a fantastic story. So I want to thank you for responding as you have to share with me your experiences, because if you share with me your experiences that I may then share it with others, we are mutually encouraged by each other's faith. And so he wrote me a lovely story, which I will share with you on Monday. And Benny wrote me many. I will take two or more from the many that he wrote, and then I'll get through all eventually. But do not stop. Keep on sending your stories. Now let us go into the silence, 